You're live. It says you're live. I'll believe it. We tried this just a minute ago. Yes. So I think we're I think we're actually here, folks. I'm Mark. This is Gary. Hey. It's Gary's Guitars. Uh, weekly get together and talk about guitars. Uh, if you can hear us, say hi, because we don't know what's going on right now. We we tried to uh get my tablets over here. Yeah, we tried to uh Get it going a minute ago, and it just it's going around and around and around. All right. So uh, you know the drill if you've been here before. Uh, in the comments, write some questions, uh, comment on things that we're talking about. Just join the conversation, inspire the conversation, and uh, also chime in and say hi. Um, uh, Lewis, uh, Michael Kraus is here, Paul. Um, so a few uh, regulars are, are already in in the pipeline. So don't forget to uh, say hi and give us some stuff to talk about. But I'll say Happy New Year. And yeah, Happy New I Year. I just realized we are weeks away from the first annual guitar chat. Yes, the first. Yeah, it's the, the first of it. Yeah. Sometime. I think it was. It was probably pre-pandemic. Just barely. I don't remember, but actually, well, the episodes are numbered here, and we're on forty-six or something. Oh, so six weeks. We missed away. one week. All right. So yeah, five weeks. Yeah. Well, so a year's worth of them. Right? Yeah, that's that's a big goal. It's encyclopedic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So go back and watch the other fifty-two hours of, you know, of these. They're roughly an hour each. Um, so to get things kicked off, we usually just start with one of our own uh, topics. While we're waiting for the folks at home to chime inspired. in. So here's one that came from earlier this week. Happened mm -hmm. in the shop. It's going to spark a discussion, hopefully. Amps that begin with B. <laughs> from This is from <laughs> yeah. Paul. Yeah, exactly. So, tell, so yeah. tell everyone in what's going on with uh, amps that begin with B. Somebody had brought in a Fugera, I think it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I forgot there was something odd about it, and I don't think it got fixed or something. It was something like it needed, to, you know, the, the that big, huge chip that right. has forty legs on it needed to be changed. Anyways, I was weird. standing at my bench, which is next to Paul's bench, and he was working on the Bugera. I'm working on. He turns to me, and says, "Do I work on Bugeras?" <laughs> I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "Well, isn't that one of the ones I don't want to work on anymore?" I said, "Oh, the B amps, the Behringer amps that begin with B, Behringer, Star, Black Star, Bulgara. Uh, um, give us another uh, B amp. If, if an amp begins with the letter B, beware. Right. Um, frequently not fixable. Can you think of more to fix other amps that begin with B? Bogner, Bogner, Bogner. Yes, stay away from the Bogners." <laughs> bad cat. Now, bad cat are not bad amps, but I mean they're built really nicely inside, especially their premium ones. We had one of their really nice ones mm. in the shop, like their USA made yeah, ones, yeah. Or whatever. I wanted to take a picture of it. It was so beautiful <laughs> inside. The point to point wiring was exquisite. Mm. It, it was. Uh, it looked like art, fine yeah. art. It is. <laughs> but um, most of the, but it needed a bunch of work already, and it was only a few years old. Mm. And uh, some of the other, the economy ones that use printed circuit boards rather than point to point, they 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 get problems and they shouldn't. You know, when they're a couple years old, someone comes in with a, a, a bad cat. So careful with the bad cats too. Right. Uh, Blue Doty, Blue Dotney. I don't know that Boogie. Boogie's actually Mesa Boogie. Well, yeah, that's so we work on Mesa kind of Boogies. Boogies. Yeah, yeah. They're not easy either. They're not easy, but. They're a sports car. In it is. It's like working on, yeah, you know, a car a with Jaguar a Jaguar or something. Or no, like a, you know, what's the car with the backwards and the Saab? Saab had backwards engine, right? Sideways. Side? No, no, not sideways. They had backwards engine. Backwards engine? I had a Saab. I don't remember that. Except um, nobody wanted to work on it. Nobody wanted to work on it. Right. But they can be worked on. Right. Just nobody wanted to work on it. Right. And someone's calling after hours. So. Oh, well. Sorry, folks. We closed. Oh. Yeah. Bedrock. Bedrock are all right. Bedrock yeah, uh, that could be, yeah, that could yeah. be an exception to the B. Well, maybe it should be Asian-made amps to start with B. Blue Doe Tone is the name of the amp. Oh, don't know that one. Blue Doe Tone, don't know that. <laughs> um, all right. So, in the meantime, we'll just let that phone ring out. No, hopefully, maybe they'll leave a really funny message. 
right? <laughs> and we'll all get to hear it. Um, question from Albert. Um, does a tube amplifier need to have the speaker broken in for 50 hours or so? <laughs> uh, would a Fender Tone Master amp uh, need the same treatment? I think we talked about this before. Maybe you had left before we got to the question. Well, I don't Maybe it was a week I wasn't here. I oh, okay. So, yeah, the, the idea of breaking a speaker is the speaker, which is mostly made of paper, gets to move a bunch, and then that paper just loosens up a little bit, mm -hmm. and then uh, usually it helps, you know, your, your response or something. Right. Like yeah, the age old is they're kind of stiff when they're new, and it's not yeah. just tube amps. It's any, yeah, any amp. Yeah, any it's not just a tube speaker, amp. speaker, yeah. car speaker. Uh, yeah, once they're broken in, they usually sound better. They respond smoother. They're not stiff. Um, and I know a trick from, uh, I don't know if it was Paul that figured it out or Mark Steves, but um, sometimes uh, older speakers develop funny sounds, take it out, turn it 180 degrees, yeah, and then, yeah, put, put it, it back, back in. in, so now gravity is pulling the other way, problem solved. Yeah, every once in a while, yeah, the voice coil will, will, will sag just enough right. to just barely touch on one end of its, you know, of its, its extension. And cause like a, uh, uh. Yeah. and yeah, you can actually flip a speaker over, and then gravity will be pulling it on the other yeah. way. So rotate your speakers. Yes, <laughs> rotate your mayonnaise and rotate your speakers. Uh, Buddha amps. Where did the oh, Buddha come through yeah. here? How are those? We remember that. I can't say that we saw many of them. I think uh, uh, that's another B. So yes, uh, it doesn't hurt to break in the speaker, but it'll just break in while you're using it. It's it's not like. Yeah. Some huge difference. No. I, I used my Tone Master. I bought my Tone Master. I went out and gigged with it that day. I was like, I was leaving the store. I'm like, I'm going to a gig and I'm taking this with me. And it's been mine ever since I bought it. So, um, let's see here. Looking forward to hearing it. Uh, what What is the cheapest? Okay. From Michael. Michael Krause. What is the cheapest, crappiest piece of gear that you own and that you love? Like a horrible practice amp with a six-inch speaker or something that sounds great. Well, this sounds like something for the whole room, too. Everyone out there can chime in with that. Yeah. I talked about this a little when Jake was here because we talked about what the challenge we gave was everyone's got that one piece of Behringer gear that they use. Right. That's great. What is it for you? Yeah. What is the one piece of gear that made by Behringer? It can be a pedal, which I do have a Behringer phase pedal. Mm -hmm. It's a much, you know, and I tried it against the electro harmonics that it's a, a copy of, and I kind of liked it better. Don't tell him when I said that, <laughs> or Michael will be in big trouble. Um, but uh, at the time, I was digging it. Mm. Do you have any like I'm dirt kind of, cheap? I, I have almost nothing anymore. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I'm thinking back, and it's not coming, nothing coming to mind. I remember some cheap gear that I hated. Um, so yeah, yeah, Behringer is definitely on the do not buy list. Don't buy Behringer uh, used, or buy it, but don't expect to get it fixed. Mm. It's just um, it's ironic because Behringer makes a lot of the parts that go into everything else. Oh, do they? Especially pedals. Oh. Like all the pedal yeah. chips. Oh. So if that. you don't know about Behringer, sometime when you're not watching the show, look it up. Um, because uh, Uli, I think it's, his name is Uli Behringer. Mm -hmm. Uh, started he was a it was a German company that had Chinese production and they were one of the first companies to really get you know some cheap super cheap gear with quality some kind of quality to it right and uh, then he built Behringer City there's a city in China called Behringer City really? that's and it's a it's an entire city that's just a complex of workers and factories that oh. make stuff so Behringer makes a lot of parts that go on other people's amps and, know that. And, uh, yeah. but their parts they, they don't sell those parts to us. And they don't, uh, and they're not, uh, yeah, they're not great at, they don't share schematics or anything like that. Right. So yeah, I think that was a good part of Paul's problem with the steady stream from the Guitar Center, the Behringer stuff. Yeah. Can't get parts. They're too expensive to fix, and they won't send me a schematic. I don't know what to fix. And yeah. say no. If it's a Behringer, no. And that's one of the few. I mean, some of that no B amps is a joke. Well, you know, right. bad cats are all working a bad yeah. cat. But. It's a nice little guideline. It's like my wine drinking. We, before I learned anything about wine, someone gave me a great piece of advice, which is never drink 
wine that has an animal on the label. <laughs> and if you eliminate all the wine with animals on the label, because you know 80% of it is bad. <laughs> there, there is some wine that has an animal on the label that is, is not bad, but just take that out of the equation and then move on from there. So okay. if you're looking for a tube amp, just do, you know disqualify the bees and go for the others. <laughs> all right. Um so I'd like to go chronologically a little bit here. Um Please discuss neck uh, attachment, bolt-on versus set, especially in light of the newer, cheaper guitars. That's a good point. Yeah, so, so we mean it's cheap guitars with well, set necks. Cheap guitars with set necks right. and set, or bolt-on necks. And why is a bolt-on neck good and why is it bad? Uh, they're just different. They're different, okay. Fender is traditionally bolt-on. Gibson's traditionally set. Uh, there's also neck through which is different from a set neck. Um, yeah, to me, it's sustain is the big thing. So I mean, a bolt-on gives you more sustain. No, less. Less sustain. Less sustain. To keep I mean, I'm of, sorry, yeah, the set yeah. neck is more sustain. Yeah, because the wood is vibrating together. They're glued um, literally together. But still with a set neck, you have two pieces of wood you're gluing together and hoping that they sustain, they work well together. Yeah. With the neck through... You have a neck, and it goes to the end of the body, and your strap button's on the other end. So you know it's one piece of wood. It's going to vibrate well, um, and that vibration gives you the sustain and affects your tone. Um, but Fender dabbled with set necks. They never caught on because they didn't really sound like a Strat or a Tele anymore. Um, uh, yes, I will say this about Fender set necks. Fender does not make a set neck guitar in the U.S. or in Mexico. Uh, it's not surprising. All their set neck guitars are Asian made. Yeah. I think they just don't have on the Fender side of the factory. They just don't, you know, they can't do a mass production set neck guitar. Mm. They're just not set up for it, and they don't want it. That's part of the reason they. No, it's not their tradition. Yeah, it's a big change for them. And the Gibson also had some bolt on neck cheap guitars that. We're fine, but they didn't particularly sound like a SG or a Les Paul or anything. They're, I think they still make the basic model uh, Epiphones or Boltons. So. Yeah, I mean, they, they do make some Epiphones that are Boltons, but more Epiphones are coming set neck, including right. one, one we have here for sale. It's certainly not more work to make a set neck guitar. I think I think because of CAD cutting, it's not more Probably as much anymore. anymore. That's why the Asian companies can do it so well, right. and Fender doesn't bother doing it. Because Fender, Fender in the custom shop, don't mean because the Fender custom shop and the Gretsch custom shop are the same shop. And on the Gretsch side, things they do set necks all day long. Hmm. Yeah, but um, the USA made Gretsches have set necks, but the USA made Fender no. <laughs> Reminds me of a semi joke that I used to tell people who had. Um, bolt on neck Epiphone acoustics. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, well, the good news is it's a bolt on neck, so we can fix it. The bad news is it's a bolt on neck. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. It's not going to sound as good. Or the bad news is you need a neck reset. The good news is we, we can, can do it. it. Yeah. So <laughs> that's not going to be $500. Bolt on yeah. necks are great. You can yeah. shim them, you can play with them, uh, you can change them. It's pretty common. Most of the Fender, it's pretty common for uh, pre CBS Fenders to have shims in them from the uh, factory. Yeah. I've seen quite, you know, mm -hmm. a few of them. Oh, they yeah. just they put the neck on. They go to do the set. Like, yeah, not quite right. They throw a little shim in there. You can even tell factory shims. Yeah, because they were the back well in the '60s. They were these little red pieces of very thin cardboard cut in the same sh particular shape. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. So yeah. that's the stock shim. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not all guitars had them, but they'd slam it together, <laughs> string it up, go, whoops, this one needs a shim, which then, of course, led to the micro tilt in the 70s, um, which had its own issues, but saved having to take the neck off to adjust it. And that's the only good thing about it. I uh, micro tilt, I'm not, I'm not a fan of the micro tilt. Well, yeah, one so. of my main goals working on those guitars is to set it up with the micro tilts oh, off. Yeah. First <laughs> thing, turn off the micro tilt and see how we can do. We have to. We'll turn it back on. But Behringer so Super Fuzz. Um, That's what someone, uh, Michael, said about his cheap gear. Or a Boss MG10 mini amp. It was, you know, this is back on the subject of, of mm -hmm. great cheap gear. Cheap stuff. 
Um, any of that Japanese made guitars, those all have mojo, I think. I, I have a soft spot for all of those, even the like the, the one you're working ones. on. Yes, exactly. it's worth nothing, and you're gonna put three hours into it. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's one that just uh, came in. It is literally, it's not worth nothing. We could easily sell it for $99, mm. but the frets were all falling out of it. I defretted it in 10 40 minutes. seconds. Right. No, when I just pulled them out. Yeah. I just went like, doop, 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 right. doop, 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 just like, yeah. The frets just were all not could attached. You probably just tap the headstock and then all Yeah, they all just out. like. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I do have a soft spot for the, the old Made in Japan stuff and the newer Made in Japan right. stuff. All right, let's catch up with the room here. Uh, here all guitars there. get some respect. Yeah, that was the that was the motto on the original bumper sticker. Yes, here at guitars. that, that yeah. was the original thing, and explains why we spend a lot of time fixing guitars that don't they work. Deserve it. Oh, we got a Starcaster. I was explaining this Starcaster. So let me try to briefly say this. So there is a guitar called Starcaster, and it's this thing behind me here, oh, yeah. and that's a reissue of the '70s thing that Fender made a hollow body with a bolt-on neck, but. Fender likes to reuse their legacy names a lot to get a little, you know, cachet. And I think they were sitting around at a meeting going, like, what's the name that we're never going to pull out again? We can just sully, you know, we, we can just, like, put it in the toilet. And they're like, what about Starcaster? Like, yeah, we're never going to make Starcasters again. So they called their department store guitar the Starcaster. Right. Yeah. Not knowing that later they'd make something called a Starcaster, and they'd ask for $400 for it, or even more for the Player Series version. But Fender Starcaster came in, and I was explaining this to a customer. This guitar came in, we put new strings on it, did all the setup work, and it's only, and the sign said $69. And so a complete setup is $75. Right. A set of strings is $8, uh, $650. Right. So you actually are getting the guitar for free and a discount on the setup. <laughs> and, a free set buy, yeah. <laughs> and a free set of strings. So. Because it's marked sixty nine dollars here in the store, but yeah, you gotta keep them going. You know, let's let's we agree on that. We we'll have to right. fix them up. The Yamaha TA amp, the one with the styrofoam speaker. Oh, I'm the TA twenty. I remember seeing a Yamaha styrofoam speaker. Hmm. It's that stuff, you know. Um, yeah, there was the Fender one with yeah. the styrofoam speaker, and I think I do remember the Yamaha one. Ooh. And the speaker works. <laughs> um, must sound great. Every time I saw one, they were they're broken. Broken. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. like a styrofoam and paper. Or, you know, no. Who says styrofoam never decomposes? <laughs> <laughs> I've had many Behringer mixers die on me. Yes, they die. The power supplies die and all. Mm. So they just die left and right. And the power supply costs as much as the mixer. I so, think you know. You know Reminding me of uh, Brian, one of our former guitar teachers who's retired now. I think somebody gave me a little Behringer powered PA system in a box. Uh -huh. It's like a 12 inch speaker with three channels and controls all in one box. And uh, I forget, it was working. And Brian saw it and went, Oh, does that work? I said, Yeah. I think I basically gave, gave it to him. him. Uh -huh. Um, he came back. That thing sounds great. Yeah. I'm using it all the time. <laughs> it's been here. I, I don't know how many times Paul has fixed it. And it said, At "Never bring this back." Times. Okay, I'll never bring it back. But he, I know I, he doesn't want it. But I love it, and and I'll yeah. spend another fifty bucks. That piece of crappy gear it. that will. Yeah. Yeah. Some. You know. There's such, such a thing. I. This summer. The last summer we did these outdoor shows in in, in uh, North Berwick. We called it North by North Berwick Music right. Festival. <laughs> And, um, you know, we could, uh, just this, you know, outdoor spacing, all that kind of thing. And I brought my old PV, PV, uh, PA with a couple of really old EV, the plastic molded mm. EV speakers. Right. They were kind of flat. Yeah. And that sounded great. Mm. That That is the, I mean, like people were like, oh my God, the vocals are so good. And it's like, <laughs> it's a PV head and the speaker just loud and clear with spring reverb. Um, do you prefer outdoor gigs or indoor to indoor gigs? Uh, now I do. <laughs> <laughs> I used to hate outdoor gigs, but last summer that's where it was at. Yeah. You just gotta if you want to play, you gotta be playing outdoors. And I did some indoor gigs, but I did an indoor gig uh, that I shouldn't have done in November. Right. Yeah. So. Um. So yeah. 
for now, I'm not doing gigs until it gets warmer, until yeah. spring. I'm yeah. just going to stay hibernating. I could think of some great outdoor gigs, but they were festivals. Yeah. You know, if there's a good sound company there and everything's... Run around doing stuff. Here's know, your bass, sir. Plug right you get in to here. play yeah. with uh, <laughs> Little Feet or something. Yeah. It's great. That's a great outdoor gig. Yeah. yeah. But other than that, you know, playing in somebody's backyard usually is not that much fun. Well, they like that. And so here's the funny thing, and I don't want to talk too much about gigs and not guitars, right. but guitars were at the gig. Right. Um, people were so happy. This was we, the first of these shows when people just got like their first shot. People were still wearing masks and mm. stay, and they could were out in the field and could be, you know, spread apart. And just, but people were just so happy to be there. And so we just did it past the hat. And uh, the hat happened to be a, a shopping bag or something in a wheelbarrow. Both bands, each band played an hour. Each band got four hundred dollars mm -hmm. worth of donations. People were throwing twenties in there. Oh, they were great. just so happy to be there. So I'm like, this is a good gig. Mm. This is better than we get paid at a bar. So we're like, why are we going? Why are, why are we playing bars? You show up at the bar, you got to rent a tab for your band because they only give you one free drink, and then you got to pay the bouncer and pay the sound guy. If you're in Boston, you, the sound guy gets paid out of your pay. The, this, the door man gets paid out of your pay, and if there's anything left, you might get some of that money. Right. It is nuts. <laughs> Whew, sorry to vent on that. That's all right. Gig stories. So, uh, they made an acoustic and electric department store Starcaster. Yeah, there was an acoustic right. Starcaster, which was terrible. The, the, the Strat one is not bad. The acoustic Starcaster is probably, it is like, makes a Johnson look mm. deluxe. Right. Yeah, I remember seeing some, I think they were from Walmart 25 yeah. years ago. Starcaster Strats that were, I got it for $59. Oh, you paid too much. Sorry. Yeah, and this thing needs uh, $75 worth of work. Right, and it still won't be very good. <coughs> yeah, that that didn't go over well either. They gave up on department store guitars for sure. Yeah, and, uh, luckily, when they realized there was no money in it. There was a, let me just check back here and make sure I didn't miss anything. I did miss. A question last week, if anyone's out there who asked it, someone asked about uh, Leslie simulator pedals. Mm -hmm. We have the Volante that's here. Um, we have one from uh, Strymon. Tom's line. Yeah, the Strymon. Strymon one, yeah, the that Volante. That is, yeah, yeah. That's the Volante. Oh, yeah. Right, right. Uh, Electroharmonics makes one that's good, and the uh, the Neo Ventilator is the, the one that the organ players love. Mm. So that's probably really good. Right. But uh, the Lunchroom Monster, I, saw, I almost bought it for the store yesterday. I was like, oh. but um, you can't, uh, I don't know. Uh, Leslie Pedal's a high, and that has been here for a year. Right. It's a, it's, a, it's a tall order. It's $350. Right. You and... could probably find an old Leslie somewhere for that. <laughs> but you have to carry it around. Yeah, then you carry it around. Um, but it's worth it. All right. What makes a good harmonica amp versus a guitar amp? Uh, most guitar, most harp players I know use small five to ten watt tube amps cranked up to Turn ten. Turn them all the way up, yeah, because they want lots. Well, they want a fair amount of distortion or overdrive, um, and harps are kind of loud. And into a ten watt amp with a microphone yeah. stuck right to it, it can be pretty loud. Yeah, they're crazy uh, loud. Uh, yeah, the harp amps people you you know like those little. And harp players had them to themselves. A lot of guitar players weren't digging the practice right. of the little amps, but now little amps are so hot. But I think the, the tube thing, the natural overdriven sound is a key. Uh, yeah, that, not just a distortion pedal yeah, of the harp does not, not sound good. Thing. Yeah. No, it's got to yeah. be the tube malfunction. The harp player I played with for years had a uh, Fender Bassman 410, which was like the amp at the time for harp players. Yeah. Um, well, that's it. So I was going to mention that, that I did a recording session with Kim Wilson yeah, um, as an engineer. And uh, yeah. he came in with, uh, he borrowed from Duke Robillard a Basement 410, yeah. a Tweed Basement 410. Right. Duke made him promise <laughs> they wouldn't play harp through it. He's like, don't play harp through this amp. What else is Kim Wilson going to do? No, but he was going to let uh, the guitarist use it for oh. guitar. So he came in under pretext that, right. no, the guitarist needs an amp. Let me borrow. And he brought it in the studio. He goes, nobody take any pictures. I don't want Duke seeing. Duke can't see me playing through this amp. Because I promised Duke I wouldn't play harp through this amp. But this amp is the best amp. Right. 
itself. Um, uh, that's. Uh, I hope you didn't. He was a character. We didn't rat him out, but he's like no pictures. Yeah, and don't, don't list take any pictures. Credits, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Duke, for the. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, let's see here. The old H and K Rotosphere. Oh, this is about the Leslie uh, uh, simulator. Was great. Four hundred dollars used. Hmm. Yeah, using cat. Rotosphere, yeah, probably, yeah. Uh, there's some good Leslie simulators out there now. Mm. Um, they because the processing is working all right, and it, you know, I, I tried the I tried the Scryman. I'm a I'm a Leslie snob. I own a couple of them. Yeah. I've owned a Leslie since I bought one from you in 1993. Right. We talked about that previously. Oh, that's the one that would have been in the barn for a while. Yeah, the one with the dead mice in it. Right. Yep. Yes, right. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, you know I'm a Leslie snob and I use the uh, the Nord and the Leslie effect on that. Mm -hmm. and that that's you know, nice. Right. I saw Kim Wilson with the Thunderbirds at the Orpheum. He did an unamplified harmonica solo. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that guy's got some lungs too, man. He, he's singing. Yeah. You know, so I remember I saw him at a Ben and Jerry's festival back in the '90s. Not a huge harmonica fan that I am. Um, <laughs> I enjoyed the band, and he, and then somewhere in the middle, he played five minute, all by himself. Yeah, so yeah. And my jaw hit the ground and went, "Okay, I'm missing something, or he's the best harmonica player in the world, or something." <laughs> yeah, because yeah. that was great. Yeah, yeah, he's got a feel. That's what he's all feel. That's yeah. for sure. And he doesn't play the same thing over and over again right. either. He's always been there. So, um, um, all right, let's make sure we're caught up with the room. Best compressor for me is the Keeley. Someone mentioned we we're talking about compressors last week. Oh, by the way, there is a video I made earlier this week that you can check out here on the same channel about all about compressors. But don't leave now. <laughs> Go, you know, after this is over and check that out. So here's another question I want to ask you. Me? Pot values. Because we're talking about pot values this week. Yeah. There's the, you know, there's, you know, so let's just take everyone back. You know, that you were talking about volume and tone pots in the guitar. Mm -hmm. uh, traditionally, a Fender uses 250. Well, single coil pickups. Single coil, like 250. 250s. Humbuckers and Gibsons 500. in general. 500. But there's some options in the pot thing these yes. days. And what's the difference? Uh, what happens if you accidentally put, or not I accidentally put, uh, a 250? The and a higher the value, so 250 we'll say is the lowest. There are lower, but not in common use. Uh, 500 is higher value. One meg is higher value. The higher the value, the more trouble passes through. Mm -hmm. So the thinking is, say with a humbucker, you want a 500. It's a little little extra high end pass through because humbuckers have inherent less high end. That's yeah. so what happens when you make a humbucker and reverse find one wine. Um, you put a 250 in a with a humbucker guitar, it's fine, but it'll be a little dark sounding. Um, you put a 500 on a Strat with a single coil, it'll be a little too bright. Um, and Is it, that possible? Is it possible to have a Strat that's too bright? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and then tellies are even more so. Uh, tellies for a long time came with one meg pods, mm -hmm. which uh, I remember as um, it's too twangy. Is there yeah, something yeah, we yeah, can do about yeah, it? That, that Put some 250s in it. Yeah. It'll help. Interesting. Uh, that's like, you know, like we're talking about 50s, 60s tellies or, you know. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. Um, but if I remember this conversation correctly, it was because we just ran out of 500s. And, and so did also, everyone else. And we went to order some and they're not available. And all parts didn't have them. WD didn't have right. them. Fender didn't have them. But I did. Not too long ago, because somebody asked me about 300K, which Gibson did use for a while. It's an in-between. It's closer to 250, but it's a little brighter. So if you want to darken up your humbucker guitar a little bit without going to mud, 300s can work. So I ordered some. So What's the other off? There's another off uh, value, that the 300, but isn't there like a higher than 500 or something? Uh, one meg. Yeah. Well, I thought there was a, hold on. Well, Nothing right. I know of in between. And Ooh. now that I say it, I think actually Gibson used 350s 350. to be accurate. But you can't get those anymore, but you can get 300. So you got those close enough. Uh, so that's the big thing is the, the tone of it, how much high end gets passed through. Um, they do go down to, uh, to what, um, 
100 K and there's less. Yeah. I did. You can put a 25 K in your guitar, but it's not going to work very well. Um, Cause that's hardly any resistance. Yeah. Uh, well, I remember wiring out the volume pot on a guitar. Cause it, most because it was in my way. It was a conversion. Mm -hmm. I mean, why don't we just wire the pickup right out? Yeah, that's the Van Halen trick. Yeah. Get rid of all that resistance. Yeah. Pickup, jack, amp, cord. Cord, yeah. yeah. That's a, uh, worked sure. for him, and that's yeah. where the famous Van Halen guitar came from, with all the guts hanging out and quarters and stuff. Yeah. Um, he said, let's just, I don't need all this stuff. Bypass it all. We might have left the volume control. Initially, I think he left the well. I mean, different versions of this. I, do, am I recalling this? this is, I bet there'll be a bunch of Eddie Van Halen lovers out there who'll just jump on oh, yeah. saying this. Isn't didn't the original have the the five way switch like still in it, like just mounted sideways behind where where the middle pickup used to be, or something like that? Is that something? I actually remember it was like taped onto it. So. Yeah. So he had the switch still attached, but it was on disabled or something. Right. I mean, there's some. It went through the switch, but yeah, not. I, I remember reading an interview with him back then, and um, he said, "Yeah, it just occurred to me that you know, the resistance, resistance, resistance. The less resist, I don't want the resistance. I want <laughs> my as much output of the, from this pickup to that speaker as possible. So let's eliminate wires, caps, pots, anything we can eliminate." Mm -hmm. And that was part of his sound. It's a thing, but that yeah, that developed over the years too with his different versions of his right guitars yeah, and stuff. He was a tinkerer; he played with it a lot. I can see, like, I'd say ninety percent of the time, my volume and tone are all the way on. Right, that's where it should be. And I uh, and I only use them like if there's a problem. Right, if I'm playing and everything's inexplicably bright or something, like, well, whoops, and I'll just back right. off the tone a little, or like, oh damn, this guitar is too loud. I'll turn it down until the song's over, and then I'll go turn down the whatever made things go wrong right. and then put the guitar back on 10. Well, when your pot is on 10, it's doing really nothing. It's still there, but it's not. It's offering minimal uh, interference. <laughs> as soon as you activate it by yeah. turning it down, this is in a passive circuit, yeah. obviously, then resistance increases, uh, things start to change. Uh, you know, jazz players in particular, I don't know why they like to run their volume on three. Um, yeah. So I can, you know, play with it. I said, yeah, but it doesn't sound as good on three. Put <laughs> it on 10, turn your amp down. What did Wes Montgomery do? That's what I want to know. Yeah, I don't know. Did but, he mess with his. But, uh, but there are people who do mess with the use that volume pot is essentially as a tone control. You know? Right. And uh, Dave Druin is a customer here. He's one of those guys that does that. Yeah. He's always playing with his volume pot, but for a reason, he's become a master of playing with yeah, his volume yeah. pot. Right. It usually lands around eight. Right. I think he'll just sit there playing with it, playing with it, and then, you know, just, so, you know, we'll put down his guitar, I'll go look at it. Oh, that's on eight. Well, I think the thing to be aware of when you're mostly with the volume pot, but the tone too, uh, it changes the tone. It doesn't just turn it down, it, the sound is slightly different. Um, so, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Just right enough, away, you yeah. may find that. You know, this particular guitar with the volume on seven is the way you like it. Yeah. Um, but for me, just as a general rule, everything on 10. Um, somebody I know saw Albert Collins when he played in Portsmouth shortly before he died. Said he came out with his telly. I think we told the story. Yeah. Walk up to the amp and just put everything on twin. 10. Just ran his fan across <laughs> the top. <laughs> everything on 10. One, two, three. Everything yeah, on <laughs> <laughs> that was the sound. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, they do uh, various things besides volume and tone. What was, speaking of the old time stories, there's one story I wanted you to tell today. I was going to trigger you into telling it. What was it? Because <laughs> then you talked to, which you one? talking to Peter, was visiting, and. Um, oh, just now? Yeah, what was that? It was a good one. Hold on. Uh, maybe it was, it'll come it's to a me. wood stove one? Yes, the wood stove. So we, okay. we have to first of all tell you it's it's humidity season. It's dry season in our humidity uh, flip-flop in New England. Please humidify your instruments. Keep it away from heat sources, especially wood stoves. And so you told the story about a guy who just yeah. loved to keep his seagull next to his wood stove. Right. Well, Peter and I <laughs> were talking. Peter is the uh, luthier that we work with, and he just moved to shop. And so I haven't seen him in like three months. 
So I don't know, we just started chatting and telling guitar repair stories. And he told me the story, the $700 crack repair job he did. <laughs> uh, somebody brought in a guitar that took, uh, I didn't do the math, like 100 cross patches, yeah, right, right, right. which is a lot. I mean, I've yeah. seen some cross patch guitars that had like 20, and that's mm -hmm. a lot. This one had like 100. So it means every inch, All top, the way, okay. back, sides, this guitar was cracked. Like Peter said, I told the guy, it's going to be you know, hundreds of dollars. Mm -hmm. This is a lot of work. Uh, so we got talking about cracked guitars. And so I told him the wood stove story about the guy who bought a brand new uh, Seagull Grand. And a few years later, three or four came back and said, I, I got to show you my guitar. There's problems with it. And I opened up the case and the bridge had come off, which I think is what finally stopped him from playing. Yeah. Yeah. But the top was loose in spots. The back was loose. The neck was loose. Uh, the top was uh, warped. It was falling apart. There was cracks all over it. And I said, what did you do to this guitar? Yeah. Nothing. I just play it and put it in its stand. I said, well, something happened. I mean, where's the stand? Right next to the wood stove, <laughs> which in New England is running a lot yeah. in the winter and is... You know, can be a hundred degrees next to the wood stove. Yeah, and uh, quite dry. So it, uh, it all the glue joints failed. It fell yeah. apart slowly, and as it fell apart, it warped and twisted. Uh, so we, Peter said, "Oh, for your stream tonight, why don't you do the wood stove warning?" Yeah, okay. So that's what There's we're doing. That. But then the other wood stove story is is with the Ed oh, oh Ed. <laughs> Here's the good one. Folks. Well, this is, doesn't have to do with cracks. No, but it's but, a good wood uh, stove story. Yeah, we had a uh, a eccentric. Instrument and repair person mm -hmm. in Portsmouth many years ago. He's passed <laughs> Notice away. he didn't use the word luthier. <laughs> uh, well, he, yeah, he wasn't. All a right. Luthier. So Chris, who worked for our store, uh, used to he he created a verb in the past tense. <laughs> um, and so Ed, well, I don't know. You don't want to speak speak poorly of the of the, oh, but dude. he changed his last name into an ed verb that meant it was badly repaired. Right. This thing's been. Well, yeah, you got, yeah. We, we, we could spot Ed's work. Yes. We'll put okay. it that way. <laughs> oh, look at all the glue uh, holding that bridge on. <laughs> um, anyways, um, he was a character. He was a great guy. Um, not extremely meticulous, but uh, he sold uh, cheap uh, kids' violins. And he told me one day, this, one, this older woman came back with the violin she brought for her grandson for Christmas, and it didn't work, and it didn't work. Uh, Ed, Something's wrong so with I looked at it. Yeah, okay. He snapped it in half and threw it in the wood stove he had in the shop and gave her another <laughs> violin. Said she pretty She's much so... hit the floor. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it cost me like $30 was the wholesale price. Yeah, right, yeah. It was worth more as firewood. Yeah, and then so fix it. In it goes. Oh, the sound post fell. Oh, no. yeah. it's, <laughs> it's not worth the labor. Right. <laughs> Things that happen in uh, the North Country. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so to remind folks, uh, if you have any questions or comments, leave it in the uh, chat section, and we'll get to your your questions, comments. You can add to things. You can ask questions, right. all that kind of thing. Gara's Guitars, Guitar Talk, happens once a week, Wednesdays at 6, usually. Uh, Jimmy Joe Fine says, and keep your humidifier clean. That's what I'm doing today. Well, that was the point of our conversation yeah. with Peter was humidifiers. Uh, as he put it, uh, February, March are coming up, and that's crack season. Yeah, that's when the cracks start showing. People up start showing up and dried yeah. out all winter because it gets a little dry right now, but it's just going to keep getting drier, more heat, more dryness, right. and your guitar is just going to crack. But also, this is a good point that Jimmy makes, which is um, um, if they're dirty, they can make your fungus can grow in them, and they'll just there'll be a fungus generator that just pump that fungus into the air. And it's bad for your lungs. Oh, he's talking about like a. Room yeah, yeah, like your room humidifier. Oh, yeah, it gets all like change the water, change the filter, clean it, yeah. whatever. Um, they do take some uh, work. Uh, Russ is asking, Russ R, thoughts on purchasing a sound hole pickup for, for PA, an old laminated Norman B15 acoustic guitar, looking to plug into a looper from, for home practice? Yeah. If so, what pickup would you suggest? Uh, Fishman Rare Earth Humbucker. The Fishman Rare Earth, which is great, yeah, 
but it's 200 bucks. Well, yeah, if you didn't ask for the price, <laughs> what the best? <laughs> what the best Richmond Rare Earth? Seymour Duncan makes a good one. We have the we have a couple. We have got the uh, the Fishman makes their Neo D series, yep. those are fine, which are all right for $199. Um, they're humbucking as well, but there's something you know, there's a different magnet technology. Yep. Uh, we, we sell the Gretsch one because it looks cool, right? But it's also uh, $89. Yeah, or any, something. I mean, any old magnetic pickup will be fine, especially if you want to use it with a looper, you, you unless you want to sound like super, you know, you, you like a little. So the cheaper pickups will have a little bit of, you know, high end in them or right. something, but that'll be kind of cool too. Well, it's kind of like the gold foil electric guitar pickup thing. Yeah. They have a sound. So, so I'm I'm over here canceling bots. This, we we've gotten popular enough for bots to come into our chat and start. Oh boy. Start messing with stuff. So well, that's I think the good, important uh, the important thing though about um, sound hole pickups in particular, and especially the magnetic ones really doesn't matter what guitar you put them in. They're going to sound about the same because they're not really picking up any guitar tone. They're picking up the strings. The strings are so, just, you know, 10% um, of the guitar. If you have a $4,000 great sounding acoustic guitar, this, the sound hole pickup's not going to particularly sound like that. It's going to sound that's like it's why, I think that's why Fishman invented the Aura. Because people were like, I plug in my Martin, this thing doesn't sound like a Martin. They're like, what are we going to do? Well, let's sample a Martin. Right. And then put that into the you know effects yeah. you know yeah well there so, are ways to do it yes yeah so digitally so actually people will be playing a Martin guitar with a pickup in it plug into a box that digitally simulates a Martin guitar right <laughs> so how's that for is that ironic it's unfortunate <laughs> we know that is it a true irony is it the opposite of what you would expect well, we're down the digital rabbit hole yeah so anything's and it will and it will be done possible. All right. I think we're caught up on the chat here. I'm just double checking. So here is a um, here's just a, one of the kind of general questions that I had. Best upgrade for a guitar and the worst upgrades for a guitar. So if someone has a Strat and they're like, hey, I just want to you know do something nice. Get my guitar. Everyone likes to make their guitar unique in some ways too. That's a lot of people are into upgrading. They just want to right. change something. Yeah. So, what's the best way to upgrade? We'll just say we'll start with a Strat. Well, uh, we'll have we'll, we'll present we'll pretend it's a mid-range one. Yeah. Not custom shop. Not a Squire. Not a Squire. Maybe uh, a Vibe Squire. Well, or maybe yeah, classic Vibe or a pre-player series made in Mexico. Okay. So like so mid pot upgrades are are are, are right there, you know, right? Because the the made in Mexico it's, it's to me it's a toss up. Yeah. Um between pickups and bridges. Um there's arguments to be made for both. If you're getting the sound you like out of the pickups and I'd look at the bridge. They're stamped metal or cast metal, whatever it is. They're cheap. Yeah, they don't. The cheap do, one, yeah. They're more of a tone sink than anything else. Um, a nice hefty block on the bridge, made out of good metal, will yeah make things work. Better. What about those brass blocks? Have you uh, had experience with those? Uh, I've been curious about that. Well, I'm old enough to have survived the, the bronze, brass the era, brass age yeah. of guitars. <laughs> The brass brass nuts, brass saddles, brass picks, brass yeah. strings. Everything's got to be brass. Brass, 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 brass. brass frets. Uh, I had a guitar uh, with brass frets. Yeah, it was a hard a K. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Me and everybody I knew after diddling around with it. Um, this includes two people that fixed guitars at the time. Decided it was they were just, brass was a tone sink. Yeah. Sure, it gave you more sustain, killed your tone. You want sustain and you don't care about your tone. Brass it up. Otherwise, don't use brass. Well, speaking of which, we just got a chime in from our old friend Mike. Yes, Mike. In Hungary. He just says he was in Ed's shop one day. A symphony player came in. So he picked up a fiddle off the wall and started playing Strangers in the Night. <laughs> I'm lucky to be alive. The symphony player? No, Mike. 
my guess. Oh, oh Mike did. Oh. Mike picked up in front in front of the, <laughs> the Jethro style. Uh, Mike had a band called the Jethros um, that played. You describe the Jethros. Go ahead. <laughs> Look it up, folks. You can Google that stuff. It was uh, just um, it was a challenge, really, playing as badly as possible. Two talented musicians playing as badly as possible. And it's not losing complete sight of what was going on. Well, yeah, that's a simple way of putting it. <laughs> um, well, you asked me to describe Right. Uh, well, I was uh, also in a band with Mike where he played trombone. Um, yeah. At amazing levels. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how else to put Amazingly, it. <laughs> the playing was no good, but it yeah. was loud. <laughs> uh, New York, New York in particular. Um, but um, I'm surprised you didn't say a new nut when we talked about upgrades. Uh, Michael just said, uh, uh, nuts. Yeah, nut, you know, a bone nut can always, uh, oh, yeah, after out. pickups in a bridge, maybe, uh, yeah, you know, nut tuners. Uh, the, some of the composite nuts now are not like terrible. I mean, they've, they've, they've figured out how to make a right, you know, a, a cast nut that isn't just plastic crap, but right. you know. So, but yeah, nut is always a good upgrade. Um, practice is a great upgrade. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Don't upgrade the guitar, upgrade the you player. Upgrade you, yeah. <laughs> Would a four hundred dollar Yamaha or Epiphone acoustic electric be decent for open mic gigs, or should I go with a more expensive guitar? It would probably be fine. It'd be fine. We sell. We have four hundred ish dollar. You know, five hundred is usually the number. Right around five hundred right now. This is inflation, right? Yeah, a little more than 500, a little less than 500, you can get something that you can plug in that will yeah. be all right. right. Make it a solid top. Treat yourself. Yeah, that's the big thing. Make sure the guitar is a solid top and buy it new because Yamaha's, the, I mean, we talked about this before, but I'll say it again. Uh, once a month, at least, sometimes two times a month, someone comes in excited. I found on Craigslist. I found a red label Yamaha, <laughs> and they'll put it down on the, on the on the counter, and they'll open it up, and it's like, oh, it sounds so good. But but can you make it play any better? The, action, the action is, is high, terrible. and the answer is no. No, they well, just unless you got a thousand dollars. Yeah, well, no, seven fifty maybe. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they all need neck resets. They all have falling tops, and not all, but often. So sometimes it's better just go out and buy the new guitar. Yeah, um, I think, well, I'd say probably close to 100% of the ones that are for sale. Yeah. Because we've known about these guitars for long enough now that all the good ones have been bought, and they're not going to be And the sold people keeping them are really Because really they are that. really good. Um, so if you see one for sale, it probably is one of those bad ones. Yeah. I mean, there's a better chance that it is because right. people hold on to them. And, uh, yeah, Craigslist, uh, you know, I don't know if it was that – uh, yeah, that can be risky. And then, then it's like, oh, a guy had an amp, uh, he brought in for repair. He's like, I bought this in the parking lot. Oh, of a I pawn heard that shop. conversation yeah. the other day. Yeah. And it's like, never buy anything in the parking lot of a pawn shop. Did you think you're getting a deal? He's like, oh, man, I'm just about to pawn this, but I'll sell it to you for $200. That's right. what they offered me inside. And whatever the thing is, just don't do it. Yeah, even though it sounds like a good idea, the bad things happen in the parking lots of pawn shops. I'm getting ready to replace the switch and pots on a 90s Fernandez Strat. They've always been noisy. Well, that's a... Uh, well, there is a simple spray cleaner yeah, you can, yeah, solution clean them, to that, yeah. but at this point, they may well be worn out. They may out. be worn out by now. In 90s, that's so, 30 yeah. years old. Yeah. yeah, switch and pots, jack, while you're in there, do the jack. Yeah, um, and then another 30 years from now, people will curse you for having done that. Like right. People who did that with their fenders 30 years ago. Right. <gasps> There's like resoldered a broken wire. Yeah, like uh, you know, my uh, oh. you know, or what they'd be like. Ah, oh, this switch, this three-way switch. I hate it. You know, I put a five-way switch in this thing, will you? Right. And uh, they did it, and they you know switch sound. You know, sound. It's like, hey, this switch is crackling, bad contacts. <laughs> it's only three-way, anyways. And now it's like, oh, you lost a thousand dollars off your vintage value, and go and then take a picture of that. And go on one of those pre-CBS forums. Mm. Just show it to everyone and like watch the heads explode. <laughs> you did what? You changed something on a fender? <laughs> More than once I've you had... fixed a fender? 
I've had this conversation more than once. I've, I guess I'm half joking, but I'm so, sort of serious that uh, I can resolder to fender factory specs. Yeah. I can resolder that wire on that pot and nobody will know that it's not factory soldering. That's true. You and can? There is, yeah. Well, yeah, you just do. And you have to, it's a touch because it has to look right. The dollop of solder has to be right. Yeah. The shade of gray of the solder when you're done, <laughs> if you cook it too long, it will be too gray. Right. If you don't put enough heat to it, it will be too shiny. There has to be the, the solder you right. use, but yes. But still, you know, this, this gets back to this thing like you got to fix a guitar if it's broken, if you want it to work. So, yeah. I hope the Fernandez market doesn't go insane then. It might. Who knows? But it went thought? insane uh, 10, 15 years ago. Fernandez were worth a Fernandez lot. from the 80s are exceptional. Yeah. The and, ones, uh, the Tokais, yeah. the Fernandez. And there was another one that really took off. And then they made the Elite 2s, which is probably what you have from the 90s. Also good. Really yeah. good. Decent, you know, guitar. And, you know, yeah. not... Um, so you never know, but it's your guitar. Play it, fix it, and play it, and enjoy it. Um, CTS pots are awesome. And then Jimmy says there were not CPS from the uh, CTS from the factory, like Fender. There are mini pots. So yeah, the Fernandez might have had those mini pots. Yeah, yeah. Common thing on the Asian made guitars, not the full one inch pot, but uh, you know maybe yeah. a half inch or right. three quarters or mini something. pots. Alphas or something. And I remember putting uh, some, uh, someone came in and, and they wanted to swap the volume pod. I'm like, oh, well, let's put a real volume pod in this thing. I put a CTS, and, you know, $6. Right. Great. I'm like, okay, you know, just come back in like 20 minutes. I'll put it in for you. And uh, I'd be damned if it didn't fit. It was well, one of those made in Korea offenders. No, the hole in the pick guard wasn't big enough. Not the hole in the pick guard, the actual slot. Oh, the slot. Yeah, that's right. That wasn't big enough. Was, oh, so what am I going to do? Am I going to swallow my pride or am I going to take out the router? I waited till he came back, yeah. but I told him, you know, right. I'm going to have to chip away. Sometimes some, you have you know. to use the Jeep parts. Yep. I used a tapered reamer to fix my metric holes. Yeah, you can yeah. just, you know, just ream out the hole a little bit. I That's just fine. did that on that Dan Electro that needed a pot. Yep. Yeah. That, that's fair game. Yeah. Uh, just don't do it to your pre-CBS fender. Don't let anyone know you did it. Uh, the problem that uh, you'll encounter frequently is that you take out that cheap pot, the shaft on it is different size from the CTS shaft. Mm -hmm. So you put yeah, your yeah. new CTS pot in, you grab your knob, and it doesn't, doesn't fit. fit. Like, oh, damn. Yeah. <laughs> that happens. That does happen as well. Yeah. I frequently try pot shaft sizes with the knob before I put the pot in. <laughs> okay, this one's going to fit. All right. Anyone want to see Gary's head explode? <laughs> no. Jimmy of Fine, <laughs> Jimmy Joe Fine, just said, nowhere near as good as Alphas. Alphas are actually pretty good. Mm. Alpha pots. What do you um, think? <laughs> are Alpha pots better than CTS? Uh, Define better. Do they sound better, work better, last longer? I, they may sound fine or the same. They... Uh, work fine. I, I just put an alpha in that Dan Electro because that's what was in there. Yeah. And uh, he didn't want to spend much money. They're three dollars instead of six dollars. So. Uh, but uh, I'm pretty sure they don't last as long. Yeah. Uh, that's been my experience. They are probably good for 10 years, maybe more. CTSs are good for 20 years, maybe more. Mm -hmm. you know, this is a regular <laughs> use. So um, yeah, I have nothing against them. But I figure you're going to pay me to put a pod in there, spend the extra three bucks, and get twice as much life out of it. Yeah. Um, as far as sound, I, they might be the same. I don't know. They both work fine. <laughs> now, did the oldest uh, fenders, I can't remember the last time I've been in one. I thought they have Claristat pots in the old uh, ACBS. Back right? then, yeah. yes. Uh, Claristat mm -hmm. and something else in the pre CBS stuff. Yeah, what was the other company? Huh? Because Clarestats are made in Dover. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Clarestat factory. I don't know if they made them for California, but yeah, they, there was a Clarestat factory in the town that I live in. It's not anymore. Um, 
if Mike's still there, he'll remember the other Fender pot name. It was typical Leo Fender every year. He'd do his budget and figure out, okay, next year we're going to make 4,000 guitars, so we need this many pots in Jackson. Mm -hmm. And he put Just out the bid. Call out, yeah. Okay, um, Jensen in Utah in Oxford, I yeah. need, need 5,000 speakers. What's your price? Utah's cheapest. We're using Utah's this year. Yeah, yeah. That's Clarestat's right. cheapest. We're using Clarestat's this year. Well, that's why there's uh, well, silver tone guitars are often branded uh, are, are, are branded silver tone, but they're made by Harmony, Dan Electro, and K, and then yeah, other companies. Same thing. Whoever gave them the best they just, price. Yeah, they just took a, they took bids, and so right. like, this year the silver tones are Dan Electros, which are very different than Harmonies. Right. But that's what you, that's what's under the tree this Christmas. Right. <laughs> Um, because uh, that's what uh, Sears decided to go with. Right? Right. So, old-fashioned business. So, someone uh, made a good point. Uh, don't forget to hit like. I keep forgetting to do that. You know that YouTube thing where like hit the like button and subscribe and then, but that's is actually important if you, you like it. Like this, right? More people, yeah. They <laughs> go down, and hit the like button, like it, like it, like. I don't it. See anything down there? Um, because um, that does help YouTube uh, show this to more people. Check out the other videos. I'm going to, I kind of made a, maybe if I say this out loud, it, I'll, I'll hold my feet to the fire. I'm trying to make one video a week that's just the, that kind of uh, the 10 minute long explanatory videos. I did one lot this week uh, on compression pedals. Got one planned for next week. I'll just try to do those more often. I just fell off the horse in uh, November. December and October. I just start, you know, just holidays, stuff. holidays, Gary's big vacation, Jake's right. big vacation, my involuntary vacation. Um, so, uh, I have a CTS pot and an arch stop. That's a problem. Said Danielle. Yeah, they can, they can fail too. Yeah. Yeah. So um, they break, they crack inside. There's a, it's called a wafer. It's a thin thing in there, and yeah. they can crack, and then it doesn't turn, doesn't work. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, anything can break. Uh, if you're, I don't know where you are, Danielle. Bring it by, and we'll have a look at yeah, it. Yeah. If it's yeah. just dirty, we got the magic cleaner. Some people, uh, yeah. Sometimes, they, yeah. Sometimes the magic and the and if you need a cleaner, we use deoxids. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's got to be the original formula deoxid. It's got to have the small uh, sprayer on it. Right. Don't, not right. too right. much. Pump looking thing. That big pump and stay away from that. It costs real money, but it's don't use WD forty. Don't use anything other than the deoxid. Yeah, right. Because I tried them all before. Mark Steves told me about deoxid. Yeah. Radio Shack and any play. Oh, contact cleaner, and it works. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The TV uh, said, TV dial cleaner. Yeah. Yeah. Get rid of that. Use this. Whoa. The thing is that the thing that's in it that's carcinogenous and terrible and outlawed in the in the in the state of California, but what it does is it it uh, eats up the corrosion, and then that solution of corrosion and liquid evaporates into nothing. Right. So it actually removes the corrosion from the site of the corrosion, which a lot of others they just put a lubricant in there. Right. They just you know they just kind of so it's better it might, for a yeah. couple of days. Yeah, and then it just you know it's bad again. So that's the stuff, uh, and we got it here, and we can do it for you too. Um, the alphas have tighter or at least equal tolerance to the CTS. Yeah, they're all right. They're you know, fine. But uh, that's just something I remember uh, Gary, oh, alpha, because we were looking for those 500 Ks. And he's right. like, alpha, ah, oh, really, yeah. Well, there's born pots. There's others that are, you know, high end. Yeah, yeah. Super tech. There's no end to that, too. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, to my ear, and they're no better. Um, mm hmm. But you can't clean them. They're sealed. Sealed pots are bad. Yeah, I'm sealed pots so you you never they answer, get yeah. dirty. Yeah. Well, we, actually, we have uh, repaired sealed par pots, and, and some we had to actually disassemble it apart. and like we're in like really clean it with like little files. Right. And stuff. Or if you're lucky, you can drip it down through the shaft. Yeah. But um, I have a small hair. This is Danielle again. I have a small hair scrunchie wrapped around the shaft until the top, and that stops it from rattling. Ah, it rattles. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, old pots can rattle. Um, could be something in there or just something. Yeah, that could be absorbing the rattle. Mm -hmm. That's a good, you know, yeah, scrunchy, sure. If you can take it out easily, uh, take it out and uh, there might be, there should be a lock washer on there inside the cavity. That yeah. When you tighten the nut from the outside, it's firm. 
uh, lots of companies don't bother to put a lock washer. They'll put a flat washer. And sometimes they don't sit right, so it things and never it, quite uh, right, uh, and it can cause right a little bit. Yeah, um, so I take it out and put it back, and with a lock washer if you have one. Yeah, it, it might be, cure it. Yeah, it could if be you that. Get at it. And there could be yeah, they're hard to get at sometimes for sure. It depends where it's located. Um, so um, that's all the pot talk. Welcome to pot talk. <laughs> <laughs> if you Googled pot talk and got this, I hate to. Well, I'm it sorry is legal in New Hampshire. New Hampshire, no, only medical. Well, well that's mm. why. Yeah. Well, you, <laughs> for you, it's legal. You can get a prescription. That's not that. Oh, hard. my back. Hurts. Oh, yo. <laughs> um, pot talk. You get a lot more views. Yes, we will. Uh, but we'll get uh, a lot more dislikes. <laughs> All right, so you've done it again. You wasted another perfectly good hour listening to Guitar Talk. Um, so thanks again for watching. Uh, be sure to check out the other videos, Instagram, Facebook. Stop by, give us a call, whatever it is at. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Anything else I forget to say? Uh, no. Um, have a good new year. Stay warm. Stand by for the end. Good to see you all. Stay humidified. <laughs>